Namaste. Welcome to Youth and Development, produced by Today's Youth Asia. In the TV show Youth and Development, we bring young leaders face-to-face -face with the key players of Development Works. My name is Janesha, and today we have with us Mr. Eric Henry, founder and managing partner of Conflict Management, based in Washington, D.C. Henry, you've worked in different scenarios in um, several conflict affected areas and you've indeed done it very successfully. Are there any techniques um, which help you, which you use uh, while dealing with um, such uh, situations? Um, the number one technique I think to start off with is listening. Um, and uh, that sounds trite, it sounds obvious, but when you get into these conflict situations, uh, people uh, are what we call in the bubble. They're, they're so focused on their view and the passion behind what's happened to them and what they think is right, it's almost impossible for them to see any other view. Uh, so we usually start off uh, by trying to listen to various of the different parties um, so we can just hear their story uh, of what's gone on. Um, and, and then what we try and do is once we've heard the stories, um, our job is not to decide what should happen. That's not what we do. Our job is to help the participants have a better conversation about what's going on and what they should do. And, you know, the, the first challenge usually is that, that these parties feel so passionately about what's happened to them that they almost can't talk to each other. They can't listen to each other. Uh, so what we try and help them do is, is see each other as human beings again um, and begin to listen to each other and help them with that process. And then once they're listening to each other, um, what happens typically, what you see in, in conflict situations, is that people want so much when they've got the other side's attention to tell their story, their narrative. And usually when they tell their story, it comes out uh, with quite a bit of heat behind it and uh, high advocacy, you know, my view of what's right. And it often carries with it a lot of blame. If I'm right, then you're wrong. And so what we try and do is uh, get them to see a different approach, which is that um, there were things that happened and there were thing are things that may happen going forward, but let's look at today as a joint contribution. Uh, we got to where we are today from a variety of inputs. It's not one side's fault or the other side's fault. Um, everybody in some way contributed to that reality, and it's a more helpful frame to start those discussions if you get to the, out of the blame frame because nobody wants to be to blame. If I blame you, uh, you're going to take that blame like a hot coal and you're going to hand it back to me. And uh, blame tends to be sort of a backward looking construct, right? It, it's looking for fault and to punish. And if you're trying to do something good and move forward, you really don't want to be looking for blame and punishment. You want to be looking for opportunity and going forward. So that's normally where we start, and that's the first thing I think is, is good listening to what people are talking about. Our country is facing the lawlessness, and uh, how do you, like, what is your opinion on that, and how do you think you can improve that, or how can, how can you make it better? Well, I think the lawlessness that you refer to uh, has increased over the last uh, number of years, certainly, that I've been traveling to the country. And um, when we look at lawlessness uh, uh, around the world, Normally, lawlessness you know, has roots in, uh, it almost sounds obvious to say, a, a lack of rule of law, right? There, isn't, there aren't fundamental institutions and foundations in place um, that the people believe in um, that give enough strength to the core of society that, that lawbreakers are then marginalized. If, if lawbreakers feel that those structures aren't there and those foundations aren't there, they become more active. And as people see them become more active and, and getting things or, or not being punished, people start to move that uh, direction and you get an increase in lawlessness. So I think um, my opinion is that the constitutional reform process, you know, the other things that are being discussed here in the country are essential to resolve so that everybody has a foundation construct uh, to build a society on. And until that's there, the uncertainty, I think, breeds lawlessness.
Um, so the more certainty and stability you have, the better able you are to have the institutions of government, whether it's the military or the armed police or the civilian police, do things um, uh, to maintain the peace. And also the, just the civil institutions, so it doesn't have to be law enforcement, uh, gain more stability and power to, to do what they need to do. In what ways did you assist the seven political parties of Nepal to nurture peace and democracy and also to bring sustainable end to the civil war that reached in Nepal? Well, thank you. That's a good question. It, it almost drafts off the prior question. When we uh, first came to, to begin this work with the Institute of Peace and Justice um, uh, earlier in this decade, um, the seven political parties that you're referring to uh, were at an, what we would call an impasse. Uh, they were not able to talk to each other. Uh, they would not gather in one room. Uh, most of the discussion, at, at, if it was going on, was going on through back channels or was going on publicly through the media, through the, the newspapers and the press. And so you can imagine those conversations weren't very productive. They were all self-interested kind of conversations, and uh, uh, there were a lot of political motivations, party motivations uh, underpinning those conversations. So what we tried to do, some of the first work we were uh, accomplishing here, was to get the seven parties in a room um, and get them um, to begin to share a conversation with facilitation help from us that would be more productive. Um, and it's really, as I said, back to the first question, we had to get them to listen to each other uh, because they weren't. They were just, you know, uh, putting out their view in a very loud uh, and partisan way. And so we began to um, show them another path. And, and what you have to do in these situations, in, in any conflict in the world, is give peace, people a reason to change give political leaders a reason to change. Because most political leaders think that pushing their agenda in a very partisan way is going to get them what they want. And part of our uh, uh, challenge is to show them that if you work with other people, um, not only other people will get things, but you may end up actually getting more than you could get on your own. And when they see that there's a mutual gain opportunity, that gives them a reason to change what they're doing. If they don't see that opportunity, they will continue to pursue their self-interest. So that's what we did with the, the first couple of meetings with them, is get them to sit and listen to each other, exchange ideas, and recognize that there was a path forward that could create more value for them if they worked together um, to make changes uh, in the political system. What inspired you to take law for your further studies? Um, the honest answer would be I didn't know what to do next. <laughs> was, um, so I was, I was out of university, and I was trying to figure out what to do, uh, like many of us, right? And um, I was in New York at the time, interested in doing political work. And uh, I had to pay rent and get a job while I was doing that, as I was starting out as a young man. So I worked in a law firm. Um, and I had the good fortune, as I've had several times in my life, uh, to bump into a wonderful mentor, uh, an experienced person in the field, who taught me a great deal and somebody I respected. And so that got me interested in law. Um, I worked for two years in that firm and decided that, that I was interested in the subject of law and that I thought it would be useful for political and social and other uh, work that I wanted to get into. So that led me to go to law school. Um, and, I, and I found it to be a good decision in the end. Um, when I look back on it, I actually enjoyed the academic part of law school. It's three years, and it's intensive, but I found it very interesting. And then I, I think that training has served me very well uh, throughout my life, and because since then um, I've been an adult uh, post-law school for 30 years, but I only practiced law for about six or eight of those years. Uh, but the thinking behind the law, the, the, some of the principles, the precedents, uh, the way of looking at problems, uh, I think it served me well, even beyond the law career. So that's how I got into it. Could you share with us any unusual or interesting facts that you have come across with as a lawyer? As a lawyer, and when you talk about facts, just interesting cases or situations? or Well, um, let's see. Uh, I think probably the most interesting work I was doing as a lawyer um, was when I worked for a federal judge in the United States in New York. Um, I was what you call a law clerk, so I was the assistant to the judge. And uh, myself and one other clerk, we would help the judge write opinions and do the legal research 
and help him run his courtroom. And um, so I think the facts that were interesting there is I got exposed to a wide variety of legal cases, from big criminal um, mafia cases to uh, terrorism cases to simple contract cases, many different kinds of things would come into the federal court. And I think uh, the facts part of it that was interesting to me um, was everybody has a story again, right? They think they see the facts. And in a courtroom situation, the parties have not been able to resolve their dispute. So by the time they come to court, they're still very locked into what they see as the reality. And I think it's fascinating, um, again, if you listen to people who disagree, there's always a kernel of factual truth to both sides, right? Even the most extreme view. Um, there's, it, it, that extreme view has some narrative behind it. And I sometimes give the example to people that if you, if you sat George W. Bush here and you sat Osama bin Laden here, uh, both of those gentlemen, whether you agreed with them or not, would have a story for you of why they do what they do or did what they did and why they think it was right. And they put their head on a pillow at night, like we all do, and they go to sleep quite well thinking um, that they're doing the right thing. And so I think it's very interesting, you know, the legal training, seeing that in courtrooms, um, got me to appreciate that part of resolve and difference is understanding that when you think somebody else is ignorant or you think they're crazy, or they don't know what they're doing, um, that's actually something that should send off a warning light to ourselves. Because most people, even if they don't appear to make sense to us, are doing something that to, to them makes sense. And so if you hope to influence them, persuade them, negotiate with them, um, you have to understand what their worldview is. You don't have to agree with it. But you have to understand what someone's thinking before you can try and influence them to change their thinking. So I think the law world helped in that. I realized that even in the most seemingly clear-cut situation, there were two sides to every story, and uh, that, that helped me. We will continue with our program after a short break. Today's Youth Asia, since 2002, creating future leaders for Nepal, connecting young leaders all over the world making Nepal proud globally. Today's Youth Asia, GPO 8975, EPC 5478, Kathmandu, Nepal. Dreams come true for those who work while the dream. Welcome back to Youth and Development. We have with us Mr. Eric Henry. As a child, did you ever dream of becoming a lawyer? Uh, not really. I dreamed of becoming a professional baseball player. <laughs> That's what I wanted to do. And at some point I realized that wasn't going to happen as much as I wanted it to happen. Um, I, I saw lawyers on television, um, in shows. Uh, I knew friends of my parents who were lawyers, so I had an interest in it, but I never really figured um, that I'd do it. And, you know, you all gave me your ages, uh, you're all pre-university, but heading on this way. Um, when I was your age, I had no idea what I was going to do. And I don't think I really had a picture of it till I was maybe 22, 23, sort of the areas that I wanted uh, to get into. And, and I think the fun thing about life uh, that I've learned is that, and I think it's going to be particularly true with your generation, is it's not a linear path. You know, you're 15, 13, 17, different ages. You're not going to go on one straight line uh, to 80, right? And you're going to zigzag through your life in many different experiences. And, and that's, uh, I think, part of the excitement of life. Yeah, you can be interested in law and pursue that and, and if you find that that's served you well you could continue it or you could try something else and um, I've done two or three major different things in my adult life and I've enjoyed all of them and uh, you learn from them and I think that's a good test of, of when you're ready to leave and go to something else is if you're not learning you know if the learning curve is like this I'd stick with it that's exciting 
the learning curve starts to flatten off or get totally flat, it may be time to try something uh, different or a different spin on what you're doing. So I've tried to keep an open mind to that. Um, but no, law wasn't, it wasn't from childhood on, it was later on. You have worked as a negotiator in most of the conflict area. How do you deal with uh, all the pro pressure that comes along with your job? Uh, uh, other pressures of what kind? Um, family pressures or just work pressures in the countries where we are, security pressures or work pressures? Um, well, uh, it's a couple of different things. Um, when you're in a country and you're dealing with whatever the conflict work is, there is still uh, office work to do back at home and other clients. And my colleagues um, know this, D. Aker, who's with me here, we were just talking about this today, that you, know, you do work here, but the office doesn't stop. Um, and so I think uh, what you learn to do is you have to prioritize. And, and you know this in your personal lives. Um, and that I, I've just learned that on a daily basis, certainly on a weekly basis, I try and step aside a little bit and give myself a little private time to reorganize what I'm doing next week. And I might just write it out on some sheets of paper and think about it. And I find that those lists are constantly shifted um, because new priorities come up. And it's a very fluid environment. And again, I think in your world uh, that you're growing up in with social media and the exposure to information you have, things are moving faster and faster and faster. And so uh, at some level, you can't do it all. You'll drive yourself crazy if you try and do everything. So I found that I've got to you know, prioritize some of those things and, and make decisions about what really has to be done today or tonight, what can wait till tomorrow. Um, but it's a constant challenge because the, the danger of that is that in doing and shifting all those priorities, all you're doing is responding to short-term needs. And, and the danger of that is you just become reactive to all the requests um, and you forget sort of long-term thinking. Where do I want to be going over five or 10 or 15 years uh, with a business or with your own personal life or whatever? So I find sometimes just stepping back, putting the phone aside, putting the internet aside, scanning out a piece of paper and thinking about, you know, what am I trying to, to do this year? By, by the end of the year is helpful and, and then prioritizing down from there. Your work has you traveling to various parts of the world. So uh, with such a hectic schedule, how do you manage your personal life and your professional life? I, I should defer this to my family. <laughs> Let them answer that. It's a tough thing. I mean, because I, I love my family, my wife, and, and my children, uh, so I don't like to be away from them. Um, so I manage it in a couple different ways. Um, one is, uh, when possible, I try and travel with my wife. Uh, she has a flexible uh, work schedule. She's a consultant as well, so she can often join me. Uh, so that, that makes it fun. Um, the other thing I try and do is I try and create some space so I'm not along away for too long. Um, uh, I try not to be away from home for a month, for instance, or five weeks. I try and keep it to 10 days or, or 14 days. Um, and ensure that I have time when I'm not on, on the road. Vacation time, uh, family time, I try and make that coincide uh, with the children's school schedules in particular. So they have the summer off. I try and reduce travel during the summer. And then some of the technologies that your generation is bringing to the world have helped out. Um, it, when we used to travel, uh, other than telephone, which was very, very expensive for most of these places around the world, you could send a postcard. Uh, when I was your age and traveled um, and to Europe for, for three months, my parents heard from me twice in three months. I sent a couple of postcards, and they would take weeks to get back. Um, and now you have Skype and other media, uh, and that's tremendously helpful. So I can get on Skype you know, every evening, see face-to-face, -face and converse, and it's free. Um, so that, that is helpful. But it's the same thing. It takes some management of that because you can get so focused on your work or things like that, that you start to lose those other priorities. So it's that work-life balance that you hear about, which is always a, always a challenge. And um, I, in my personal life, I, the way I treat it is there, there's an expression in America that you may have heard or you may have a similar expression here. Some people uh, live to work. Other people work to live. I'm a little more of the, the latter. I, I, I love my work and what I do, but it's part of an overall life and, and family and kids and friends, so I try and keep that balance. Could you give us some pointers on how to become a good negotiator? 
Yeah, that's an interesting question, and, and I do get asked that a lot. What are sort of the skills of a negotiator? Um, and I think there's a couple of them. Um, we've talked about listening already. I think that's important. Um, and there's a phrase we use called active listening, which is not just listening, but demonstrating to the other person that they've been heard is very important. Um, so I think that's, that's part of it. Uh, and then going into any disagreement you have or uh, negotiation you anticipate um, with what we call a curiosity frame rather than a certainty frame. Uh, because again, even in our personal lives, when we feel strongly about something, um, we tend to go into a negotiation trying to show the other side we're right or get what we want. And I think it's helpful um, to, to keep your your goals in mind. Um, certainly you have targets and commitments you want to get, but also recognize um, that there's somebody else who's disagreeing with you, um, so they must have some reasoning behind what they want. And I need to be curious about that, even if I disagree about it, uh, because a curiosity mentality tends to open up other people. If you walk into a, a conflict and you're certain you're right, it doesn't really give the other party a role in the conversation. They're going to feel threatened by that. And usually people who feel threatened do one of two things. They shut down. They don't share information with you. They don't form a relationship with you. Or they fight back. And, and neither of those is very helpful to resolving the problem. So I think coming in with a curiosity frame uh, helps. And then uh, what we do uh, and spend a lot of time on um, with uh, political leaders, business leaders, and folks like that is getting them to remember the skill of inquiry asking questions because again when we feel passionate about things most of our physical energy literally our brain energy our, psycholo our psychology is we want to show them and that leads to advocacy where we're telling other people things and so what we try and reinforce is that there's nothing wrong with advocacy it's an important skill but inquiry asking questions is an underused skill and so I think the most effective negotiators I see are very good at asking genuine questions of the other side. You know, why do you think that? Why does that make sense to you? Could you tell me a little more about that? Um, not judgmental questions like, do you really believe that's true? You can't possibly be that stupid, can you? Uh, those aren't legitimate questions, right? But genuine, open-ended questions um, for the purpose of learning and understanding. It doesn't mean I'm going to agree with them, but again, I want to see their view. And once you recognize where they're coming from, then a good negotiator is trying to build something with both of those stories, a third story, uh, where both parties can benefit. Um, so I think those are the, the critical skills. Um, the one other skill I'd add on, um, which we spend a lot of time working on with people, is preparation. Uh, going into a negotiation unprepared is not a good recipe for success. And I think you know this. If you play an athlete, if you're a sport player, an athlete, or if you're a top musician, uh, you would never go into performance without practicing and practicing your sport or that song you're going to sing or that instrument you're going to play. People with negotiation tend to, to sometimes go in and think, well, I'm experienced, I'm going to do fine with this. And, and it's our experience that the people who do best take the time to prepare for it, to really think about their own interests, Imagine what the other party's interests are. Try and think of possibilities. How we, might we resolve this? You know, deal pieces we could look at. Um, they gather data, relevant benchmarks, and objective criteria and, and precedent to discuss. Um, think about what no deal looks like is very important. If I can't get a deal with them, what would I do? And what would they do if there's no deal? Thinking about the broader picture. Uh, so I think those are the, those are the fundamental things that help people do better in negotiation. What would you like to say to the youth who aspire, aspire to be like you? Well, I, I, I think I'd first say be careful what you aspire to. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, I, well, what I'd say is it, it's flattering of you to even ask that question. But I, I, what I would say is um, if you were to know more about what I've done and what I do, um, I think that the truth of it would be that I followed my heart. I, I follow what I like to do. And um, I have a curiosity about life. Um, I have an interest in different subjects. And I have an interest in people. 
Um, and so that's led me to do what I do. Um, but you might be very different, each one of you in this room. What drives you personally may be very different. So I think um, what I advise, if you were thinking of role models or whatever, is, is to be true to yourself. Because if you're going to be working at something, whether it's six hours a day or ten hours a day, it's much better life if you enjoy what you're doing, right? And you all, as uh, educated young people, are going to have opportunities that many of your fellow countrymen don't have because you have an education. You're going to have some choice in what you do. Uh, and that's a great luxury. When I travel around the world, there's so many people, whether it's wealthy countries like the United States or other countries around the world, where people have to do something just to survive, whatever that job is. And you're going to have some choices. So. I would say, you know, do something that you have a passion for, whether it's the type of work you're doing with today's Youth Asia um, or other things that catch your eye, law or teaching or medicine. Um, and, and don't put a, a cap on your aspirations, especially at, at your ages. Aim high. Um, you never know what you could achieve. I mean, literally in this room, we could have future ministers of this country. It's, it's not unreasonable to think that. Um, so aim high, and then as you're going through, just adjust accordingly um, when you see opportunities. Be aware of new opportunities. Um, and I think the only, the final thing I'd say is, you know, it's been my experience in life that um, if you treat people well, whatever their station in life, um, you will get good benefits from that. Um, I find that that has uh, been very personally fulfilling and, and rewarding, and, and these networks of contacts, whether they're low level or higher level, they tend to kind of circle back, and over a lifetime, that, that web and network of contacts, I think, is a very enriching experience. With this, we've come to the end of today's show. We look forward to hear your feedback. Our email address is youthtya at the gmail.com. Thank you for watching us. We hope to see you next week at the same time. Have a nice week. Namaste.